You uh, also wrote the book of Mad Men Dreams of Turing Machines. Mm. It connects two geniuses of the 20th century, Alan Turing and Gödel. Mm -hmm. What specific threads connect these two minds? Yeah, I was um, I was really mesmerized by these two characters. They people know of Alan Turing for having ideated about the computer, being the person to really imagine that. But his work began with thinking about Gödel's work. That's where it began. And it began with this phenomenon of undecidable propositions or unprovable propositions. So um, uh, there was something huge that happened in mathematics. Which is people imagined that any problem in math could technically be proven to be true. It doesn't mean human beings are going to prove every fact about everything in mathematics, but, you know, it should be provable, right? I mean, it seemed kind of not that wild supposition. And everyone believed this. All the great mathematicians, Hilbert was a call of his to prove that. And Godel, very strange character, uh, very unusual. He, he was a Platonist. He, he literally believed that mathematical objects had an existential reality. He wasn't so sure about this reality, this reality he struggled with. He, he was distrustful um, of physical reality, but he absolutely took very seriously platonic reality and often his own way of thinking. And he proved that there were facts, even among the numbers, that could never be proven to be true. You have to think about that, how wild mm -hmm. that is, that even a fact about numbers seems very simple. Uh, could be true and unprovable, could never exist as a theorem, for instance, in mathematics, unreachable. Um, this incompleteness result was very disturbing. It, essentially, it's equivalent to saying there's no theory of everything for mathematics. Mm -hmm. It was very disturbing to people, but it was very profound. And Alan Turing got involved in this because he was, you know, he was thinking about uncomputable numbers. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that led him, what's an uncomputable number? A number like 0 0.175, it just goes on forever with no pattern. And I can't, I can't even figure out how to generate it. There's no rule for making that number. And he was able to prove that there were such things as these uncomputable, effectively unknowable numbers. And that might not sound like a big deal, but it was actually, it was actually really quite profound. He was relating to Godel intellectually, right, in the space of ideas. Mm -hmm. But he goes a very different path, almost philosophically the opposite direction. He 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 builds, he starts to to think about machines. He starts to think about mechanizing thought. He starts to think, what is a proof? How does a mathematician reason? What does it mean to reason at all? What does it mean to think? And he begins to imagine inventing a machine that will execute certain orders, you know, mechanize thought in a specific way. Well, maybe I can get a machine. I can imagine a machine that does this kind of thinking and that he can prove that even a machine could not compute these uncomputable numbers. But where he ends up is the idea of a universal machine that computes, um, essentially can take different software and uh, execute different jobs, right? We don't have a different computer to connect to the internet than we do to write papers. <laughs> it's one machine and um, one piece of hardware, but it can do all of these, this huge variety of tasks. And so he really does invent the computer, essentially. Um, and famously, he uses that thinking in a very primitive form in the war effort where he's recruited to help break the German Enigma code, um, which is heavily encrypted and largely believed to be uncrackable code. And, um, and, and people believe that Turing and his very small group actually turned the tide of the war in favor of the Allies precisely um, by using a combination of this thinking and just sheer ingenuity and some luck. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the other profound revelation that Turing has is that, well, maybe we're just machines, <laughs> right? And, uh, just biological machines. And this is a huge shift for him. It feels very different from Godel, who doesn't really believe in reality and thinks numbers are, are platonic realities and, and Turing kind of thinking, we're, we're kind of like, we're actually machines and we could be replicated. So of course, Turing's influence is still widely felt 
On many levels, so as to the- On many levels, yeah. In complexity theories, in theoretical computer science, and oh, mathematics, place, but also yeah. in philosophy with this famous Turing test paper. So like you said, conceiving, yeah. like what what is the connection that I guess Gödel never really made between mm -hmm. mathematics and humanity, mm -hmm. uh, Turing did. But I think there's another connection to those two people is that they're both in their own way kind of tormented yeah. humans. I think they were very tormented. What aspect? of that yeah. contributed to who they are and what ideas they developed? I mean, I think so much. I don't, I don't want to promote the kind of trite trope of the mad genius. You know, if you're brilliant, you are insane. I don't think that. I don't think if you're insane, you're brilliant. Um, but I do think if somebody who's very brilliant, who also chooses not to go for regular gratification in life. Mm -hmm. They don't go for money. They don't necessarily value creature comforts. They're, they're not leveraging for fame. I mean, they're really after something different. I think that can lead to a kind of runaway instability, actually, Yeah, sometimes. Um, so they're already outside of kind of social norms. They're already outside of normal connections with people. They've already made that break. Um, and I think that makes them more vulnerable. So Gödel you know, did have a wife and in strong relationships, as far as I understand, and had a was a successful mathematician and ended up at the Institute for Advanced Study, where he walked with Einstein to the Institute every day. Um, and they talked about, and he proved certain really unusual things in relativity. You you made reference to these rotating galaxies we were talking, and actually Gödel had a model of a rotating universe that you could travel backwards in time. It was mathematically correct. Showed Einstein that within relativity, you could time travel. <laughs> um, just an unbelievably influential and brilliant man. But um, he was probably a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, he did have breaks with reality. Um, he uh, was, I think, quite distrustful and feared the, the government, feared his food was being poisoned, and you know, ultimately literally starved himself to death. Um, and it's such an extreme outcome for such a facile mind, you know, so for, for such a brilliant mind. I think it's important to sort of not to glorify or romanticize madness or, mm -hmm. or um, suffering. Mm -hmm. But to me, you flip that around and just be inspired by the peculiar maladies of a, of a human mind, mm -hmm. how they can be leveraged and channeled mm -hmm. creatively. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of us, obviously probably every human has those peculiar qualities. You know, uh, I talk to people sometimes about just my own psychology, and mm -hmm. I'm extremely self-critical, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm drawn to the beauty in people, but because I make myself vulnerable to the world, I can really be hurt by people. Mm -hmm. And that thing, okay, you can lay the, that out. That's a, this particular human, okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a bunch of people that will say, well, you many of those things you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe don't be so self-critical. <laughs> Maybe don't be so open to the world. Maybe have a little bit more reason about how you interact with the outside world. It's like, yeah, maybe. Or maybe be that and be that fully and channel that into a productive life into, we're all gonna die <laughs> in the time we have on this earth. Make the best of the particular weirdness that you have. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll create something special in this world. And in the end, it might destroy you. And I think a lot of these stories are that. It's not that. Oh, yeah. It's not like saying, oh, because uh, in order to achieve anything great, you have to suffer. No, if you're already suffering, mm -hmm. if you're already weird, if you're already somehow don't quite fit in your particular environment, in your particular part of society, use that somehow, use the mm -hmm. tension of that, the friction of that to create something. I mean, that's what I, you know, uh, Nietzsche who suffered a lot mm -hmm. from even like stupid stuff, like stomach issues, like- Oh yeah, God, that can be all everything. Kinds of, right. Migraines is like- Psychosomatic or psychophysical, yeah. but- And all those, that's the real, it's like, 
that can somehow be channeled into a productive life. It's, mm. It should be inspiring. A lot of us suffer in mm. different ways. Yeah. I'm a big believer in the tragic flaw, actually. I think the Greeks really had that right. Um, you're describing it. What makes us great is ultimately our downfall. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just inevitable. The choice could be not to be great. <laughs> Um, and I guess I, I, that's sort of what I mean by they had already broken from a traditional path because they decided to pursue something so elusive and um, that would isolate them to some extent inevitably and that could fail, right? And whose rewards were hard to predict even. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that that all the character traits that went into their accomplishments were the same traits that went into their demise. And um, I think you're right. You could say, well, you know, Lex, maybe you should not be so empathetic. Hold yourself, cut yourself off a little bit, protect yourself, right? But isn't that exactly what you're bringing, one of the elements that you're bringing that makes something extraordinary in a space that lots of people try? Um, to break down. Yeah, and there, but we should mention that for every girl on Turing, mm -hmm. there's millions of people who, who, don't, have, right. who have tried and who have destroyed themselves and without, without, without that, reason. I would find it impossible to not pursue uh, a discovery that I could, I could imagine mm, my yeah. way through, if I can really see how to get there. Uh, I cannot imagine abandoning it for some other reason, uh, uh, fear that it would be misused, which is a real fear, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a real concern. Um, I don't think in my work, since I'm doing extra dimensions in the early universe, but or black holes, you know, I feel pretty safe. But I mean, who knows, right? Bohr couldn't think of a way to use quantum mechanics to kill people. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot imagine pulling back and saying, nope, I'm not going to finish this. You know, I'll give you a counter example mm -hmm. of an exceptionally brilliant person, Terence Tao. Mm, brilliant. Brilliant mathematician. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. He is better than, out of all the brilliant people I've ever met in the world, he's better than anybody else at working on a hard problem and then realizing when it's, for now, mm -hmm. a little too hard. Oh, that I can do. It's stepping, <laughs> stepping away. Yes. And he's like, okay, <laughs> this is now a weekend problem. Uh-huh. Because he has Absolutely. he has seen too much for him. Everybody's different, but mm. Gregory Perlman mm -hmm. or Andrew Wiles, who who give yes, themselves that's a great story. fully, completely mm -hmm. for yeah. many years over yes. to a problem. Yes, and for every every Gregory right. and Perlman, and they might not have cracked it. Yep. So uh, you choose your life story. I like totally <laughs> agree. Now I'm not going to say. Sometimes I take too long. Yeah. To come to that conclusion, but I will proudly say, as most theoretical physicists should that I kill most of my ideas myself. <laughs> okay, so you're able and to walk away. I am absolutely able to say, oh, that's just not, I mean, I'm not gonna deny that sometimes I maybe take a while to come to that conclusion longer than I should, but I will, I absolutely will, I will drop it. And that is, that is any self-respecting physicist should be able to do that. The problem is with somebody like Andrew Wiles, you were describing who, to prove Fermat's last theorem, it took him seven years. Was that the number? Something like that. He went up into his mother's attic or something and did not emerge for seven years. Is that maybe he did? He was on the right track. He wasn't wrong. And, and, but that's so, it could have been interminable. He still might not have gotten there mm -hmm. in the end. And, and so that's the, the really difficult space to be in, uh, where you're not wrong. You are onto something, but. It's just asymptotically approaching that solution, and you're never actually going to land it. Um, that happens. <laughs> and he had a really, I, it would break me, straight up break me. He had he had a proof. Yes. He announced it, and they somebody found a mistake in it. That would just break me. Yeah. Because you now everybody gets excited. Right. And now you 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 realize that it's a failure, and to go back. I mean, back, it was taking a year for people to check it. It's not the kind of thing you yeah. look over in an afternoon. <laughs> and then to to have the will, to he have the confidence back. and the patience to go yeah. back, unbelievable and do, story. Rigorously go through, work through it's it. It's a great story. But then there's another great story. Gregory Perlman, mm -hmm. who uh, spent seven years, he mm -hmm. and turned down the Fields Medal. He did it all alone. Right. And then after he turned down the Fields Medal and the Millennial Prize. 
proving the Poincaré conjecture, he just walked away. Yeah. Now that's a very different psychology. Mm -hmm. That's wired differently. Doesn't care about money, doesn't care yeah. about fame, doesn't care about mm -hmm. anything else. Yep. In fact- Where is he now? Uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, trying mm -hmm. to trying to get a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. It turns out when you walk away and you're a recluse and you enjoy that, mm -hmm. you also don't want to- Take pop interviews. Some weird dude in the tie. <laughs> so it's, it turns out, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. trying, I'm trying. Well, if you look at someone like Turing, his- his eccentricities were, were completely different, right? It's not as though there's some mold, and I, I really don't like it when it's portrayed that way. These are really individuals who um, who were still lost in their own minds, but in very different ways. And Turing was openly gay, really, um, during this time. You know, he was working during the war, World War II, so we understand the era. And it was illegal um, in Britain. Uh, at the time, and he kind of refused to conceal himself. Um, there was a time when the kind of attitude was, well, we're just going to ignore it. But he had been robbed by somebody that he had picked up <laughs> somewhere. I think it was in Manchester. And it was such a small thing. I don't know what they took. It took like nothing. You know, it was nothing, but he he couldn't tolerate. He goes to the police and he tells them. <laughs> and then he's arrested. He's the criminal because it involved this homosexual act. Now, here you have somebody who made a major contribution to the Allies winning the war. I mean, it's just unbelievable, not to mention the genius, mathematical genius. I mean, he saved the lives of the people that were doing this to him. And they essentially chemically castrated him as, as a punishment. That was his sentence. And he became very depressed and suicidal. And um, the story is he was, he was obsessed with Snow White, which was recently released. And he used to chant one of the... Uh, little, I don't know if you would call them poem songs, uh, dip the apple in the brew, let the sleeping death seep through was a chant from Snow White. And um, the, the belief is, is that he dipped uh, an apple in cyanide and bit from the poison apple. Now, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but people think that the apple on the Macintosh with the bite out of it mm -hmm. is a reference to Turing. Now, some people deny well, that's this. That's nice. That's nice. <laughs> um, but uh, some yeah. people say he did that so his mother could believe that maybe it was an accident. But yeah, yeah. quite a terrible end. Yeah, but two of the greatest humans ever. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why... Um, I, I tie them together, not just because ultimately their work is so connected, but but because there's this sort of impossibility of understanding them, there's this sort of impossibility of proving something about their lives, that even if you try to write factual biography, there's something that eludes you. And I felt like that's kind of fundamental to the mathematics, <laughs> the incompleteness, yeah. the undecidable, yeah. the uncomputable. Yeah. Um, so structurally, it was... It was about what we can kind of know and what we can believe to be true but can't ever really know. Yeah, limitations of formal systems, limitations exactly. of... Exactly. Biography, limitations <laughs> of fiction and nonfiction. Limitations. 